Historians track the tradition called Halloween or All Hallows Eve back to a Celtic festival called Samhain or Summer's End. It's a, a festival that recognizes that time when the season of life ends and the season of death begins and thus is thought to be that point where the veil between this world and the next is at its thinnest. It is it's a time of celebration when people lit bonfires and wore costumes to ward off ghosts, but also a time of remembrance. The people that came before us created the history that the history guy talks about during the rest of the year, but what we do with the people who created history or what's left of them after they die says an awful lot about who we are. It shows what we value, what we choose to honor. What we do with mortal remains says as much about the living as the dead, although the process intimately involves both. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In Egyptian mummies, the placement of the body represents gender. Only males were mummified with their arms crossed. Women were mummified with their arms at their sides. How the dead are arranged has a special significance and shows the character of the deceased. Take, for example, the curious burial of James Britton Britt Bailey. He was born in North Carolina in 1779. He was a veteran of the War of 1812 and a controversial figure who was prosecuted for forgery in Kentucky before moving further west. He married two sisters, not at the same time, and had 11 children, five with one and six with the other. Bailey was a hard-drinking settler with an indomitable spirit. Bailey claimed to have purchased land in what would later become Texas from the Spanish government and built a homestead where he had painted all the buildings red. But when Stephen Austin was settling the land for the Mexican government, they had no record of the grant and Austin tried to evict Bailey. Bailey refused to move on and was allowed to remain. In his will, Bailey specifically requested to be buried standing up and facing west, probably to continue his trailblazing from beyond the grave. He wanted his rifle and a jug of whiskey too. According to oral tradition, Bailey said, I don't want it said, there lies old Brett Bailey. Bury me so that the world must say, there stands Bailey, and bury me with my face to the setting sun. I have been all my life traveling westward, and I want to face that when I die. Bailey's wife honored his request and buried him standing up with a rifle and powder and bullets, but she refused to allow the whiskey. So now legend says that sometimes you'll see a light on the Texas prairie at night, and that is Britt Bailey's lantern as he searches eternally for the whiskey that he was promised. According to the stories, if you see the light, you shouldn't stop unless you have liquor for Britt Bailey's ghost. Others were more fortunate in having their burial request honored, like Aurora Shock of Indiana, who asked her husband to bury her with her beloved 1976 Cadillac Eldorado convertible. According to the Chicago Tribune, Aurora's request was granted, but the special burial required 16 plots to complete. Concrete 12 inches thick was poured around the car to preserve it from groundwater. Her casket was laid from the front to the back seat, and after her husband died some years later, he had a hole drilled in the concrete and his ashes poured into the grave so that they could ride off into eternity together. Who we are buried with also says something about our lives. Pierre Abelard and Eloise d'Argentoy have, according to some, one of the most tragic love stories in history. In 12th century France, they fell in love when Abelard was tutoring Eloise and began a relationship that resulted in a child. Eloise's uncle, Fulbert, was incensed by the affair and raged for Abelard to be attacked and castrated. Abelard became a monk at the Abbey of Saint-Denis, and Eloise gave up their child and became a nun. They wrote a now famous series of letters to each other, which survived to be published in 1616. Though some have questioned the authenticity of the letters, as they weren't published until hundreds of years after the lover's death, they preserved the story of what happened between Abelard and Eloise, as well as Eloise's rather radical, for her time, feminist views. Abelard probably died of scurvy though the disease was not called that at the time, and was buried at the oratory of the Paraclete, where Eloise was abbess. Some historians believe Eloise was buried when Ab with Abelard when she died. The legend says that when Abelard's crypt was opened to inter Eloise, that his corpse opened his arms to receive her in eternal embrace. After the French Revolution, the pair was moved to the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. Lovers are those seeking the type of love that overcomes all obstacles, sometimes leave letters on the spot marking Abelard and Eloise's mortal remains, in the hope of finding true love. Some historians question whether Abelard and Eloise's remains were ever moved, and we might never know the true story of their lives or what happened to them after they died, but the location of their remains, even though it might not actually be them, 
still continue to inspire people today. Few have made as lasting and concrete an impression as the post-death contribution of James Smithson. Smithson was the illegitimate son of Elizabeth Macy, a wealthy widow, and the Duke of Northumberland, Hugh Smithson Percy. A chemist and mineralogist, Smithson published at least 27 scientific papers, ranging from an improved method of making coffee to an analysis of a mineral which was named Smithsonite in honor of him. Smithson highly valued education and science, and in one of his papers wrote, It is in his knowledge that man has found his greatness and his happiness. No ignorance is probably without loss to him. After his death in Genoa, Italy in 1829, he directed that his fortune be used to establish a museum in the United States, a country he had never visited, which was to be called the Smithsonian Institution. He described it as an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. In 1904, Smithson's remains were relocated to the United States from Genoa, carried by Smithsonian Regent Alexander Graham Bell, and they remain there today. The museums and National View recorded more than 30 million visitors in 2017. It is one of the most visited museums in the world, attracting visitors from around the globe, and has become a symbol of learning and enlightenment. Another famous figure whose body was a symbol for a movement and who oddly continued to travel the world after her death was Eva or Evita Perón, the wife of Juan Perón, a controversial Argentine president. She was a vibrant and fiery speaker for the workers of Argentina, whom she called the descamisados, or shirtless ones. Rising from humble beginnings to become one of the most influential people in her country, Evita maintained an image of style and grace and helped advance the women's suffrage movement. She was loved by some and virulently hated by others. After her death from cervical cancer in 1952, historians believe nearly three million people watched her funeral procession and went to see her body displayed. Eight people died and thousands of others were injured in the rush to see her body. A massive memorial to her, larger than the Statue of Liberty, was planned, but before it could be constructed, her husband was overthrown in a coup and forced into exile. Avita's body was taken by the military and hidden to prevent it from becoming a symbol for her husband's supporters to rally around. According to the BBC, Evita's remains were at various times in a van on the streets, then concealed behind the screen at a movie theater and moved around various government offices. Finally, she was buried in Milan, Italy, under a different name, in an effort to conceal her location. In 1971, Evita's body was exhumed and taken to Spain, where Juan Perón lived in exile with his third wife. They cleaned and prepared the body for presentation, allowing it to sit in their own dining room for a while. While cleaning and grooming the body, they discovered the corpse had been abused, as the tip of one of Evita's fingers was missing, and her face appeared to have been struck. They labored to restore her legendary beauty. Perón returned to power in Argentina in 1973, died in office in 1974, and was succeeded by his widow, Isabel Perón, his third wife, who had Evita's body brought back to Argentina and allowed it to be displayed alongside Perón's body. Evita was finally interred in Buenos Aires in 1976, more than two decades after her death. Today, Evita's mausoleum is heavily guarded to prevent any further desecration of her remains. The guards of Evita's tomb are there to keep people out, but in a vampire-fueled craze in America's New England in the 19th century, measures were taken to keep the dead in their graves. There was an outbreak of tuberculosis in some of the New England states during the early 1800s. The disease was called consumption because it seemed to cause a wasting or consuming of the body. Because it was unknown that tuberculosis was a highly contagious disease, the vampire panic began after someone would die of the disease and then, subsequently, family members would also become ill and die. Based on superstitions carried over from the old world, community members believed the deceased were coming back from the grave to feed upon their remaining family. To prevent the supposed vampire's depredations, they dug up the bodies of the recently deceased and would cut out the heart and burn it, sometimes breathing in the fumes as an added preventative. Others would cut the limbs off and arrange them over the chest. Some would flip the corpses over to prevent them from climbing out of the grave. What they did to the bodies seems gruesome, but they believed that they were protecting the living. In an interview with Smithsonian Magazine, researcher Michael Bell says that he examined over 80 different remains that were mangled to prevent the deceased from rising again. He believes there are more to be discovered, hidden beneath the ground. Accounts during the Roman imperial period said that when a general would ride through the streets of Rome in the lavish parade that was called a triumph, that they would have a slave stand on the chariot with him, and as he rode through the adoring crowds, the slave would whisper in his ear that he was but mortal, 
and would one day die. The purpose was to keep the general from becoming so convinced by the adoration that he was a god that he would take his conquering legions and use them to subdue Rome. But it became a message for all of us that all triumphs are temporary. The reminder that we will all one day die is called a memento mori, and there are macabre examples throughout history, in art, in literature, in music. I think that history itself is a memento mori, a slave on our chariot, whispering in our ear. And whether you want to take with you a bottle of whiskey or a classic car, whether you're a politician or a scientist or an artist, regardless of the trappings of wealth, the one thing that is true of all of them is that it is all fleeting. And we acknowledge that in the complex way that we humans deal with our mortal remains. As the first century BC Roman poet Horace said, pale death knocks with impartial foot on poor men's hovels and king's palaces. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.